Good morning. Welcome to the King Institute for Faith and Culture. We're delighted you're with us this morning. Uh, welcome to students and also to those of you who are visiting from off campus. We're glad you're here to commemorate the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. after a slight delay because of weather. And we're delighted to have with us this morning Natasha Sistrunk Robinson, uh, Tina McDaniel, who is a great friend to King and also on the advisory board of the King Institute is going to introduce Natasha in a moment. I just have a couple of announcements as we get settled in. Uh, one is that there is a book table at the back, and if you're interested in purchasing uh, a couple of Natasha's books, either A Sojourner's Truth uh, or Mentor for Life, they're both available at the back uh, after the, at the end of the uh, service today. If you want some time to talk to Natasha and interact a little bit, we don't do question and answer at the end of this owing to the constraints of time, but we will go over to the Tadlock House. And if you're interested in joining us, we'll have coffee at Tadlock, and all are welcome. You just go across to the left this way, and if you have any questions about where to go, find me, and I'll tell you uh, how to get there. Please join us for that if you like. If you want some more extended time, join us for lunch. We'll be in the cafeteria at 11 o'clock in the Tipton Room, which is at the back of the cafeteria, and we'd love to see you there to have some time to fellowship and uh, enjoy each other's company. So we're glad you're here with us. Also, our next event is going to be next Monday. On Monday the 7th, we bring Dr. Bill Turner. Bill Turner is the, uh, really the grandfather of African-American history in Appalachia. He was the research assistant for the author Alex Haley for about 10 years. He taught at Berea College. He was an administrator at Kentucky State, and he's a noted sociologist and writer. Uh, most recently, he's published a book about his youth in coal country called The Harlan Renaissance. Dr. Turner will be with us next Monday in here at 9.15, and again with the coffee and lunch to follow, and we'll have him uh, in the evening downtown at Central Presbyterian Church, and I hope you can join us for some of that as well. But I'm glad you're here this morning. Thank you for joining us, and I want to ask Tina McDaniel to introduce our speaker. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Martin and King Institute for Faith and Culture, for providing opportunities such as this to hear from diverse voices that expand our perspectives and help us grow stronger as a community. So thank you for your partnership with the Martin Luther King program. So after a three-year wait, last night we were blessed to hear from Natasha at Lee Street Baptist Church. It is indeed an honor to introduce her to you this morning. Natasha's accomplishments are impressive, so I'm going to offer you a condensed version. She is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and former Marine captain. She holds an M.A. in Christian leadership and is completing a doctorate. She is a noted author and podcaster, and I follow her on podcasts. So Natasha is the visionary founder and chairperson of a nonprofit, Leadership Links, where she cultivates an intergenerational and multi-ethnic network of leaders who are committed to mentoring and raising up the next generation of leaders with a focus on using their skills and resources for the greater good of humanity. She is also the president of T3 Leadership Solutions, an organization that consults, coaches, and mentors individuals and organizations. Natasha was recently named interim president for The Witness a nonprofit faith-based faith media organization that engages issues of religion, race, justice, and culture from a biblical perspective. Now, I have personally followed Natasha's work for several years now. So as a diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioner, I was drawn to her candor, her authenticity, and as a Christian, her focus on justice from a biblical perspective. Natasha reminds us that the love of Christ should compel us to pursue what is righteous and what is just. 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verses 13 through 14, which came to my mind this morning, it says, For if we have lost our minds, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. Natasha says in her book that Martin showed you a few minutes ago, A Sojourner's Truth, she says, within the body of Christ, I believe that we have a responsibility to educate ourselves about our history, 
to reject the status quo, to hold each other accountable to Christ's standards, and to work together to become a loving, united, and righteous people of God. I'm very pleased to introduce to you this morning, and without any further delay, I'll introduce and let us welcome Ms. Natasha Sistrink Robinson. Good morning. Good. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. How about all the way in the back? Look, the lively crowd is in the balcony. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I'm so glad to be here to this morning. I was telling the crowd last night that it's been about, uh, what, three years in the making. I signed my contract to come in 2019, and I was supposed to come last year, and then COVID hit. And then I was supposed to come in January and the ice storm hit. And so I'm here with you now. I'm glad to be here. I am uh, I'm actually not going to talk about Dr. King this morning. Um, but I will tell you this for some context because I'm really here to talk about you and to share about you. And I'm going to do that first by sharing some of my story. But um, in my book, Sojourner's Truth, what I do is I share my story. Um, and I do that alongside the biblical story of Moses and the Exodus narrative, which gives me an opportunity to talk about the history of African Americans in this country. And for me, uh, Dr. King has played an important um, role and influence in my life um, in that regard. Uh, and then also it gives me a chance to tell a bigger story, which is God's redemptive story. And so I encourage you, if, you, if you're interested in, in hearing more from that perspective, to certainly go um, and grab the book. But this morning, I want to focus on your theme uh, about paying attention to our life. That's really what I want to do and share with you. Um, give me a moment. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this day. We thank you for um, new beginnings and fresh air. Uh, and we thank you for sunshine. We thank you that you held back the snow this weekend that I was able to travel and come this week. Um, and I pray that this word this morning will speak to the hearts of these young people um, and meet them right where they are. For you are an intimate God and you know each of us intimately. And so I pray that you will speak to the hearts and minds of these, your people, um, in Jesus' name, amen. So a few years ago, I wrote an article titled, um, A Single Testimony Changes Lives. Uh, the year was 2015, and it was the first time that I wrote publicly about my mother's life and her passing. And it was also the first time that I was truly vulnerable in public about the most important influence in my life. In that piece, I wrote, I am my mother's daughter, an African-American woman from South Carolina, who loves the Lord and his church. I'm a leader, a learner, a teacher, a servant, an advocate, a wife, a mother, a friend. I'm Natasha Sistrunk Robinson, who was created in the image of Yahweh and in the image of Sally. I am my mo I'm the mother of Ashley, a fearless and free girl who will praise God and silence the enemy's voice and schemes and proclaim the gospel to her generation and have the work of her hands forever attached to the gospel. And I pray this for her life consistently. This is how our life goes. For my life, I can trace my maternal line, and I could tell you that Margaret Amica Hayes begat Hallie, Hattie Felder, and Hattie Felder begat Sally Johnson, and Sally Johnson begat Natasha Sistrunk Robinson, and Natasha Sistrunk Robinson begat Ashley Robinson. And I know that we are used to hearing these liturgies and these genealogies in the Bible recounting the male heirs within a patriarchal society. 
And while my grandfather um, had a strong spiritual legacy of his own, I really don't know much about his people. On the other hand, I remember my mother's mother, mother, my great grandma, Margaret Amica, who lived to be 94 years old, or so they thought, because she didn't have a birth certificate. And I remember we celebrated her 90th birthday for a few years. She was a strong woman and she lived alone as a widower until they finally had to transition her to a nursing home. And when they did, her room was, was filled with artifacts and of items and things that were precious to her that she once kept in the home. And there were photos and there were blankets and there were sweaters and there were dresses and there were a lot of wigs because she was always a presentable lady. And there was her Bible and there was her tambourine. For when we visited, she would always sing praises to God and clap her hands and slap that tambourine on her hip. Her world was confined to that room where she took visits from family and shared intimacy with God. And then she died. And her daughter, my great-grandmother, Hattie Felder, still remains with us. She's 95 years old. And during the first semester of my sophomore year in college, my mother died. It was two days after her 52nd birthday. From dust we came and from dust we will return. I did not realize it at the time, but writing that article about my beloved mother was the first step of what would eventually become the book, A Sojourner's Truth, Choosing Freedom and Courage in a Divided World. That book is a story about my life. See, we must all learn how to pay attention to our lives. For life is an able teacher, and so is the certainty of death. Understanding our call and understanding the lives and purpose in which we are created requires an intentional investment in the small dash before our mortal physical bodies return to the dust. That's why we need a bigger story to connect our individual stories. So in writing this book, I was not writing about my life alone. I was connecting my life to a bigger historical narrative and social commentary about the lives of African Americans in this country and telling the truth about that bigger story. And to do that, it required that I pay attention to the ashes caused by racism and sexism and patriarchy and the ashes of slavery and black codes and sharecropping and the ashes of Jim Crow, segregation and lynching and violence and voter suppression and rape and the ashes of Confederate flags that hung at my state capitol for a very long time and burning crosses on church lawns and people's front porches and the blood spilling out of black bodies on a church floor in Charleston, not far from where I grew up and in city streets all across this country. Grieving in this life requires that we lament and cry to God and tend to these ashes. Integrity requires this of us. So we must not look away, but the original sin of this country is not the beginning or the end of my story. No, my life story is grounded in something much deeper. My story is a part of God's beautiful, redemptive story. For it is only those who are born of the water and of the spirit, who worship God in spirit and in truth, that will see the kingdom of God. As I grounded my life story in God's redemptive story, I focused my life and my journey on the leadership and life journey of Moses, charting from the beginning of his life to his leadership succession to Joshua, his spiritual legacy, and eventually his death. So today, I wanna to speak to you as our Joshua generation. 
For those of you who know the biblical story, you may, know, I want you to know that I understand that Egypt is not modern day America, and America is not the promised land. I know, I understand, regardless of what some of the elders like or think, that you are the ones that will pick up the mantle of government and education, the church, the social sector. You will lead in arts, in entertainment, in media, in business. This is what Gabe Loins calls the seven channels of cultural influence. And indeed, you are preparing for that sacred work now. One day, some of you will marry or be given in marriage, and others of you, some biological, some not, will take on the responsibility of rearing and coaching and teaching and tutoring and mentoring children. And like your mothers and your fathers before you, you will teach those children your ways. This reality of leadership and leadership succession is important. It's of vital importance to me. It is the reason why I invest so much of my life mentoring Generation Y and Z. It is why in a season when I'm very selective about traveling and where I go for speaking engagements, that I still choose to show up continually on college campuses and in seminary classrooms to speak to humans like you. I know the responsibilities that you will carry. And because I'm older, and in some ways wiser, I'm older than I look, <laughs> and in some ways wiser, I have a responsibility to teach you how to live a life of purpose. But before we talk about that, I do want to acknowledge the grief that might be sitting in the room. For me, that grief has names associated to it. It's not just my mother, it's my grandfather Elijah, and my son Elijah, and my cousin Felice, and my cousin Jermaine, and my aunt Marilyn, and aunt Boots, and my guidance counselor, Mr. Hemby, and my track coach, Coach Norman, just to name a few. And this grief has moments attached to it wilderness experiences and losses in marriage and finances and friendships and a miscarriage and jobs. Grief of moving and isolation and anxiety and being misunderstood or ignored or simply being a black woman in America. And for you that grief might be missing celebrations or falling short or anxiety or bouts of depression it may be things that were available or, or harming you before the pandemic. There may be certain things now that you have not spoken to the public. But I just want to honor and say that there are certain things that are worthy of your grief and your tears, your pause, your rest, your lament. And the constant battle for your mental health is exhausting, I know. And the voices in your head can be loud. And the lies that you have been led to believe about yourself through social media and endless comparison to others and perhaps on the lips of those that you thought loved you, it can be crippling to your self-image. The reality of that war that is raging within is worthy of your grief. And maybe you just feel lonely. Maybe you have experienced the death of people that you love or the death of your dreams. And maybe the weight of this pandemic is just too much. You can grieve all of that too. Yet, I want you to know, young people, that God has not left us without hope in this world. The prophet Isaiah wrote that the spirit of the Lord is upon us to bind up the brokenhearted, to comfort all those who mourn, to bestow a crown of beauty instead of ashes, 
an oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise and a spirit in the spirit in, in, in the spirit of despair. And then he wrote that the people of God will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Oaks of righteousness do not sprout up quickly out of nothing. Oak trees are symbols of honor and nobility and wisdom. And I want you to allow God to use this time to build your character so you can become that. Oaks have history. They can live for longer than 300 years. They are sturdy. They can weather the most difficult storms because their roots run deep and they adapt with nature and with time. The rings of a tree's core tells us about the tree's age, but they also tell us what the tree has weathered over the years of its life. In this way, our lives are like trees. In each year, with each crisis, each hard winter, each glorious spring, our lives tell a story. And the prophet says that we can use all of our lives the beauty and the ashes, the joy and the mourning to bear witness of our being planted by the Lord as a display of his splendor. I was 21 years old when my mother passed away. And Moses, my Moses, was dead. I realize now that even though her physical body turned back to dust, the Holy Spirit that was at work in her is still at work in the world and is still at work in me. And even in her death, she is still my teacher, my lover, my mentor, my mother, and my friend. She is still teaching me because I was attentive to her year after year when she was present and near. And because God continued to water and fertilize and allowed my roots to run deep as I watched her and sat at her feet to learn from her, especially when times were hard. And that's what I want to say to you today. Don't waste this time, howbeit dark and difficult. Don't lose hope because you have been planted. Now is the opportunity for you to stretch yourself, to grow deep roots. Don't lose sight of your call or your purpose because things are so uncertain. For it's in the times of uncertainty when we must stand on what we do know. That's the meaning of faith. That's what Joshua did for his entire childhood when his ancestors and his family members were enslaved. And that's what he did for the 40 years that the Israelites journeyed and wandered in the wilderness. Think about that for a moment. His entire childhood, his family was enslaved. And for 40 years of his young adult life, his family wandered in the wilderness. We are only in year two. After 40 years of traveling through the wilderness and watching generations of his elders die, becoming a shepherd and a warrior and Moses' aid, Joshua rose to become a leader among his peers. In the most difficult times, Joshua remembered that he was among a chosen people who were called to follow God and God's ways and to display God's wisdom and understanding to the nation. He became an oak of righteousness. Joshua was not in the darkness or death alone 
for his life story was a part of a communal story. And you are not in this darkness alone. We are all feeling it. In a time when it is easy to become self-absorbed and consumed with your inner stuff, Joshua's story compels us to remember that we are a part of God's redemptive story. And that's a beautiful story. And God is not done writing that story. So I want you to pay attention to your life story in proximity and in context and perspective of that reality. What did you know about yourself when you were six and 10? And what did God say when you were considering your college applications? And what was it that marked your highest celebrations and your deepest losses? Joshua remembered. He never forgot that he was among a people who were called by God to worship God. And watch this, that they also had a responsibility to teach their children to do the same. For understanding your life's purpose is not just about you. It's not just about you finding your way. We are to impress God's ways on the children of the next generation, to talk about God as we go in our homes, walking along the road, he said to Israel, as we lie down, as we get up, to tie God's ways as symbols on our hands and bind them on our foreheads and to write them on door frames and at our communal gates. And the big picture here is that God's instruction should always be in front of us. And the truth of that instruction is what we are to pass down to the next generation. I'm speaking to you as our Joshua generation because I hope you understand by now that all of your wisdom and your knowledge and your education and your leadership and your learning will not take place in your college classroom. You must become a lifelong student. You must learn how to pay attention to the times. You must learn how to humbly sit and learn from elders not because they're always right and they learn and they know the way, but they've traveled longer. They know some history. They can also learn from you. You must be willing to take the risk when called upon to lead and to scout out unknown and uncharted territory. You must be willing to get behind God and seek God's way because we don't know what we're doing. That's the truth. In this COVID world, nobody knows what they're doing. And if an adult hasn't told you that yet, I'm telling you, they don't know what they're doing. That's why we get behind God. Because we are in uncharted waters and uncertain territory, but God knows the way. And this is the word, not just for yourselves, but it's a charge that I want you accept, to accept now for the next generation in which you already have influence. This pandemic has revealed that we already knew there were places where we had economic and educational gaps and injustices, but this pandemic has heightened that crisis. We have children that have lost two years of learning. That's the truth. And as a military person and someone who's worked in the federal government, I'm gonna tell you, that will lead us to 30 years of economic, political, national security uncertainty. That is something that should be of concern to all of us and everybody in this room can read and write. If there is any young people in your life at all, I admonish you to help them with this education crisis. You like to use technology? Put some YouTube videos up, it's free. 
Use that for the greater good. For desperate times calls for desperate measures. And you don't have to wait until you get a degree to start leading and making an impact. Just pay attention to how God is speaking to you right now. Pay attention to the needs and the gaps that are before you right now. Pay attention to how you can lead and what you can teach right now. Life is an able teacher. And we need to understand that when God's people go through difficult times, God is often using those times to test us, to see what is in our hearts, how we act, and what we do in the most difficult times is what reveals our character and our motivations. For the Israelites, the testing in the wilderness reveals that they were, they were selfish, they were prideful, they were arrogant, they were idol worshipers. And that's what often led to their death. God warned them on many occasions about such temptations but many did not heed God's wisdom and understanding. But then there was Joshua, who was attentive to learning the Lord's ways in the wilderness. And that's how he was preparing to lead. When Israel got on the other side of it, this is not the first pandemic. This will not be the last. We will at some point get on the other side of it. So what's happening right now is that we are all getting the opportunity to grow and stretch and learn character and learn how to lead for what's to come. And that's what Joshua was doing. The book of Joshua begins after the Exodus with God's statement to this young man. And he says to Joshua that Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all the people get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I'm about to give to the Israelites. And God makes a promise to Joshua. He says, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you, and I will never leave you or forsake you. He tells Joshua multiple times to be strong and courageous, to obey God's ways, to keep God's words in front of him. And then, God says, you will be successful and prosperous. And finally, he tells Joshua to not fear, to not be discouraged. Why? Because the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I'm not saying that God is going to take us into the promised land on this earth. And again, not that America is the promised land. I'm just encouraging you that however you consider your purpose and your calling and your preparation and however you see your life going in this very moment, I want you to get intimately familiar with God's character because that does not change. And in knowing God's character, you can learn how to hear God's voice. And that does not change. And you can take the sacred time to learn how God wants you to respond to his unchanging character and his unchanging voice. That is how Joshua became an oak of righteousness. Because he was attentive. Because he had a teachable spirit. Because he was willing to accept the leadership and mentorship of Moses. Because he learned God's ways. And because he intentionally passed those ways on to the next generation, he was obedient. So when God told Joshua to get the provisions ready for what was to come, that's exactly what Joshua did. Although the people made promises, Israel did, Joshua and God knew what was in their hearts. And regardless of what his peers did, Joshua was fully committed to follow the Lord's way. And by the time they got to the end of the book of Joshua to renew the covenant with the Lord, Joshua said to the people, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then you choose yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What is the purpose of your life? Who are you going to serve? That's the question of this hour. 
Like Joshua, I have chosen to follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah. I've chosen to follow the God of Margaret and Hattie and Sally, and many of the ancestors that have gone on before me, for their ashes have fertilized the ground in which we have been all been able to take part. And they have been the people that have provided the lessons that I believe have prepared me for such a time as this. The beauty and the gift of time is of the essence. And as young people, you may still think, some of you, that your life is invincible. But I think it's a good thing, even in your young age, to contemplate the end of one's life. It forces us to pay attention to our story. It makes us think about the obituary that we want, want to be written, the legacy that we want to live, leave, the tribute that your children and your children's children will speak about you and your influence one day. Oaks of righteousness like Moses and Joshua and my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother who build spiritual legacies do not sprout up overnight. These are people that have weathered and been tested and been tried and show up faithful year after year after year, especially when times are difficult and hard. Oaks of righteousness have been planted by the Lord for the display of his splendor. And I want you to have faith that your call and your purpose is being rooted in that beautiful display even now. So do not, young people, give up hope. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful to plant and to water and to fertilize and to cause what you have planted and watered to bear fruit. I thank you that it is with your great intention that you place each of us in our mother's womb and that you created us with a specific purpose in mind. And some of us are more clear and attentive to that purpose than others. But I pray God now that as these young people reflect on these words throughout the week and the day and the years to come that they will be reminded that you have met them in this hour that they are known and loved and seen by you. And as this, it is with great intention and purpose that you have put them on this earth to work. And so God, I pray that you will clarify their call and clarify their purpose so that they can become oaks of righteousness individually and collectively as our Joshua generation to display a powerful witness and the beauty of your splendor. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, if you'd like to spend some time with Natasha, we will be at the Tadlock House for coffee. We'll be in the Tipton Room in the cafeteria for lunch at 11. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. And let me ask you to thank again Natasha Sistrunk Robinson. Thank you.